one of you as you join with us this morning. For those of you here, those of you online or listening to this after the event, it is good to join with you and share with you God's word. This morning, I talked to you about a subject I've entitled, Tis the Season, and we hear a lot about this. And uh, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through to verse 23. The Apostle Paul writing here to the church in Corinth, and uh, it's interesting because in verse 3, chapter 3, I beg your pardon, he actually is chastising them and he said, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. That word carnal means fleshly, worldly, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Why? Because Paul was writing to these Corinthian believers who were believers, but they were so wrapped up in the things of the world, so wrapped up in their own mindset that they were not focused on getting the message that God would have wanted to have got out and being the, the people and making a difference that they should have made. So I, I think when I read that and I thought, you know what, isn't this often at a time like this so much of, of this? There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of things happening. And we need to be careful that we ourselves don't get all wrapped up into that and uh, that we, we stay focused on the real true essence of what we need to be remembering. So let's read along. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 19 through to verse 23. The Apostle Paul says, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself a servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without the law as without the law, being not without the law of God to God, but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might gain by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker of with you. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks and praise for the goodness of your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your word that has been preserved for us. And as we read it today and believe it and trust it, Lord, may it effectually work within each and every one. We give you thanks. We give you praise. By Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. So the Apostle Paul writing here to the church in Corinth and when he says. For though I be free from all men. Yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. What he was talking about here is the fact that the gospel, when we understand who we are in Christ Jesus and when we believe and trust the gospel, we read and know and understand that we are saved by God's grace, that we are no longer under the law because we are freed from the law. And by that doesn't mean Paul was not saying, okay, that's it. Go out and live the way you want now, guys. You're, you're free from the law. He deals with that in Romans chapter six. God forbid that now that we are free from the law, that we're just going to think we can go out and live the way we want to. That would be a failure to understand the magnitude of God's grace and what he accomplished for us, the free gift of salvation. Do we then just take it and Squander it? No. What he was saying, he says, though I be free from all men, Paul the apostle knew he was appointed by God, folks. He wasn't appointed by a church council. He wasn't appointed by, by other apostles to say, right, okay, we're ordaining you to be the head of our this body of believers that we're going to call the church, the body of Christ. He wasn't ordained by anyone. God appointed him. The Lord Jesus Christ approached him on the road to Damascus. If you read that account in Acts chapter 9, we won't go there for time's sake. But if you read that, it is Christ who approached the apostle Paul. And he was blinded by that light. And Christ who gives him this message that he now needs to go out. And he writes into the, when he writes to the Galatians, he makes it very clear that he was not appointed by man. So hence he's saying, I'm free from any man because I'm not appointed you know, in essence, he was saying he was if he's not appointed by any church council, man, he can't get fired. 
He was there to do what he needed to do. And he says, although for though I be free from all men, he didn't walk around with a puffed up mindset and worship me. You know what he came with? A servant's heart. Very important. And what we see so often in church circles and religious settings today is what? A worship of a man, a worship of someone who is up there. We better just do because so-and-so said we must do this and that and the next thing. I'm so mindful of the scripture where Paul the Apostle says that he didn't want to have dominion over the faith of the believers. He wanted to be a helper of their joy. I do not wish to have dominion over your faith. I do not wish to say this is what you have to believe. And if you don't believe it, well, then I'm sorry, but you're going to hell. I cannot do that. I know and understand through the scriptures that I'm here to be a helper of your joy. And the only way I can do that is to point you to scripture and allow scripture to work in and through you. Because, folks, I'm still I'm, I'm forever learning and going through. There are there are things I, I know and I understand and I stand firm upon them. But as we read and study through scripture, there's greater understanding that we get. And. For me to come and then to say, well, you know, I want to have this rulership or, over you would be a failure on my part to have understood scripture. So when Paul says, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself. See that? I made myself a servant unto all. What is the opposite of that? He could make himself a ruler. To have dominion over these folks. Why did he do that? That I might gain the more. Come with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes comes after the book of Proverbs, which comes after the book of Psalms, Proverbs, and then the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. By the way, Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 19. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. You see that? No matter how good we think we could be, we, no matter how much understanding of scripture we have, True wisdom comes through that understanding of God's word and a recognition that we in our own human right have failed God. You can write next to that verse, Romans 3.23. Well, let's, let's just understand that when we look at this and we know this, we have no right to lord ourselves above anybody else. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the old adage, you've, you've heard it how many times? You point a finger at someone, there's at least how many fingers pointing back? Three. So we have to be very careful when we point fingers. So that's why when I say you guys, <laughs> keep a straight, none of them get me. <laughs> Isaiah 53. And verse six. You want a definition of, of, of sin? Here's a good verse for you. Isaiah 53, talking specifically now, Isaiah writing, the prophet writing specifically and talking about the nation of Israel, but very pertinent for us. Isaiah 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That song, I did it my way. We should do it God's way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The iniquity that is the son of us all. This is a, a, a scripture, Isaiah writing, so that the nation of Israel could know and understand they had gone astray, historically. And prophetically talking about the fact that if there was going to come a time that the Lord Jesus Christ would, the iniquity and it says, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is written 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about this for a moment. 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ comes to earth. 
And since Christ has been on earth, it's been 2,000 years. So for the last 2,700 years, this scripture has been as, as right as it was then, it, it is now. Have we not all, like sheep, gone astray? Did the Lord Jesus Christ not refer to himself as the good shepherd? Which means that there could be some not so good shepherds. Because Israel had shepherds that God had appointed and they were not so good. Led astray. Don't you find it fascinating? You know, when you see how scripture just ties in, I'm sorry, I'm just going off on a little rabbit trail here now. But what was King David doing when Samuel went to anoint him as king? When they looked for him, he wasn't there. He said, all oh, brothers were all there. And Father Jesus brings these, these strapping, first the eldest right down, and eventually gets down to number seven. And like, still God is telling Samuel, it's not them, it's not them. Then Samuel says, have you got any other children? And the answer of Jesse is, yes, but he is out tending the sheep. I mean, do you think that is in Scripture just to fill up you know, like some writer filling up and making a story. God, the Holy Spirit, folks, did not purpose a single. The Bible talks about a jot or a tittle. It, it, it is in the Hebrew. It not, not a single little umat dot was is there without purpose. Now, we may not fully grasp and understand it, right, and how everything fits in. Have you ever got through the Old Testament and you get, and you get to a point and you're reading through Scripture and then, boy, you get to a list of names. And it's like a whole page. And you're going to, by the time you get, you, 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 so those names are there for a purpose too. Because it's a historical record and everything is in scripture for a purpose, folks. So when you hear the story, David out tending the sheep. And when you read this, I, I think of that when I read Isaiah 53, 6. And I, and I think immediately my mind goes to the Lord Jesus Christ being the good shepherd. And then saying something about that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see how beautiful when you understand and you start reading scripture. As you read through it, it just sort of ties together and it just strengthens in your mind. That's why. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says it's the word of God that effectually worketh in you that believe. So you have to believe and trust in the gospel, but you have to believe and trust in God's word. And as you read it, these things sort of tie in together and it, and it brings us this clear understanding. All we like sheep have gone astray. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now this is Paul the Apostle writing to the church in Thessalonica. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 16. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians 3 verse 16. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. I think about that. Do you know that since the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth and the scriptures declare peace on earth, goodwill to all men, that there has not been a single day that a war has been fought, not been fought somewhere in the world that I can see. If you research, research it. And you think to yourself, hang on a minute. This time, tis the season to be jolly, tis the season for all things to be well. Hello. And the day after, and the new year cometh. Oh, how many times have we not stood and Wished each other a happy new year. Anybody have a year that something hasn't gone wrong? How, how can we as believers then truly say, we have peace through this verse and this. We can have peace in the chaos. We can have peace in the brokenness of this world because we have the God of peace living within us. You follow that? So what Satan's plan is, is for you to find happiness and joy in the physicality of life and the good things that are happening. Because if that is your 
you aim to find joy and peace. All he needs to do is give it to you for a short while and then gone. And then what do we have to hold on to? What do we have to hope? Now, please, I'm not. <laughs> Don't be like folks who are out there and everyone's happy. So, I'm going to just be solemn and straight because I'm not going to get involved in any of the joy and the happiness that is here. I mean, I went to do a talk at the school. I was rolling on. I was getting on the floor. OK, I needed help to get up afterwards. But nonetheless, <laughs> yeah, be happy. <laughs> I mean, I can see you guys. You guys are all happy, right? Just tell your faces so that I can see that. <laughs> be happy. Yes. God has given. He's made us emotional beings. I mean, Teresa, imagine. I haven't seen you in a year. And I said, hello, Teresa. Nice to see you. I mean, it's like. I think I'm going to go back. <laughs> the guy doesn't want to see me. Hello, Jason. Nice to see you. I know you've been away. I mean, be happy. Show happiness. Show joy. You know, God's word tells us we, we, we rejoice with those. So I'm not talking about don't be happy, folks. I'm just what I'm trying to bring across. What I'm the essence of my message to you this morning is just the season to be jolly. But it's also just the season for us to be mindful. To have everlasting peace, we need to know the reason. We need to know and we need to understand what this is all about. And if we know that, then circumstances will not dictate. And we will not be up and down all the time. Yes, we will have our emotions. Yes, we will have our challenges. But we will also have a reason, a reason to be joyous. You see, rejoicing... Is not true rejoicing is not based on circumstances. It's it's in the circumstance that we can rejoice. Romans chapter three. What did we tell you Rome, earlier? Romans three twenty three. All have sinned, right? Let's just. I know you know this verse, but let's read it together. Romans three twenty three. I'm constantly reminded by this verse because I have to remind myself that it's talking to me primarily and then to everybody else. You know, oh, we love to use this. So oh, all those are sinners, those bunch of sinners. Now, hang on a minute. I'm part of that. We are all part of that. For all have sinned and come short, fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So. We've all fallen short of God's glory, but, but, but here's the good news. We are justified by doing religious acts. No, freely. How? Through our faith in Christ Jesus. We have justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Just go with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The fifth book in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy, second giving of the law. Just if we want to put ourselves fully under the power of the law, just let me read to you and understand what Moses was telling the nation of Israel who, to whom God gave the law so that, well, let me just read it to you. Now, therefore, uh, Deuteronomy, did I tell you to go to chapter 4? 4 verse 1. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes, the statute says decrees, and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. By the way, that land is the land that everyone's fighting about right now now in the Middle East. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baalpur. For all the men that followed Baalpur, that's Baal worship, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes 
and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. So let me just stop there before I read on. So God gives the nation of Israel, he calls out Abram, names, renames him to Abraham, becomes the father of, of, of this nation. He brings them out, he makes them separate, he gives them the law through Moses to keep them a separate nation so that they can be, God is going to show the lost Gentile world now how if there is a nation that follows after his word, this is how you are to live. So he gives this instruction to them and he says, keep therefore, verse 6 again, and do them, for this is your wisdom. You notice that? Not religious wisdom, not man's wisdom, God's wisdom. And your understanding in the sight of nations which shall hear all these statutes and sh say, so if they were going to go out and they were going to hold on to God's word and they were going to do everything that God had commanded, what is the world going to say? Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so near unto them as the Lord your God is in all things that we call him upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Now, go with me to Deuteronomy 6. Verse 23. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swear unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord. The word, that word fear means reverence the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Now, read Verse 25, very carefully. And it shall be our righteousness if, underline that word if, it was conditional. If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Now let me ask you a question. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth 2,000 years ago, did he find that? No. What did he find? He found the nation of Israel who should have been leading the lost world to God. He found them in apostasy. He found them in religious bigotry. He found the religious leaders as bad shepherds. That's why he says, I'm the good shepherd. Very religious, doing a whole bunch of things. And by the way, these religious leaders had thought of a whole lot of other laws and statutes to add. A lot of things that are in the tradition that was not from God. You see, man, religion, religion, folks. Somebody said to me the other day, I'm not religious. I said, neither am I. And they're like, what? You see, because if you understand what religion is, it's man's attempt to find God. It's man's attempt to do things to make himself right before God. So I'm not calling you to be religious today. I'm calling you to be believers in God's word. And that's why the Apostle Paul was talking about, I am all things to all men, because he was a religious Jew. And what did he need? To, he needed to recognize and understand no longer was his religiousness going to be able to give him any stature. But when he was talking to a Jew, he would know and understand the mindset of the Jew. And he would say, you know what? I'm not going to argue all the points with this guy now. And here's my point. There are going to be people, and every year this time I see the same and hear the same things. People talk about stuff and bring stuff, and, and I see Christians having a ding-dong, full-out battle on Facebook and TikTok and all these things with one another about what's right and what's wrong. Now, this is my, I'm going to just, this is, this is not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not telling you what you must do. I'm just saying sometimes, folks, you don't have to get into that big battle because Satan would like nothing more than for us to be arguing about stuff and not just getting the gospel message out. You follow that? So it's a kind of thing of being understanding, knowing and, and understanding that, you know, 
when we when we know what God's word teaches. We also know that Paul, the apostle, says that the servant of the Lord must not strive. But be gentle. Apt to teach patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Imagine for a moment that I was a pilot, I'm not. We do have a pilot here, at least one in our presence. And I was sitting on the plane and I said to you, Jason, by the way, let me fly the plane. I think I know how to do the job better than you. <laughs> All right. And I started arguing. At the end of the day, you're going to know and understand I'm, I'm presenting an argument that I actually think I know stuff about, but I don't know. But at the same time, if we are 5,000 feet up in the air, is it wise for this man now to start having a fat old argument with me? No. You say, sit down, I'll let you, we'll talk about it when I land the plane. Do you understand? Sometimes we have to be careful. Now we can get around a family table at Christmas time, and somebody will start talking about stuff that is not scripturally correct. And then our fleshly desire, you know when you, when you get that feeling in the pit of your stomach and you're like, no, I'm going to let them have it. In front of everybody here now, I'm going to give them this, this grace teaching right now and I'm going to give them this free gift of knowledge right now. And as you start this argument, by the time you get into the third sentence, the meal you've already had is starting to churn within your stomach and now you have indigestion. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I don't know if you've ever found that. I'm just saying, be wise. Be wise. No one understands that there are people that do not know and understand what they are saying. Pick your battles. Sometimes it may mean that in a discussion you rather remove yourself from it because by staying there, you either have to say something or you have to agree with what. The worst part is, that, so do you agree with what I'm saying? No. But you are free to believe what you wish. So we need to be mindful of this. And I seriously believe that this time is one of those times, you know, if we could just suddenly go, it's gone. I mean, wouldn't we save a lot of money? <laughs> what I want to challenge you to do is make it about family time. Make it about gathering together and getting together and understanding the essence of what we are sharing. And let your conversation be seasoned with salt. And understand that there are folks that... Choose your battles and be mindful of saying, you know what? I'm so grateful for this period of time that I can spend with family, that I can be reminded of what our Lord and Savior accomplished for us. You follow what I'm saying? You just give the truth. And hopefully the Bible says they would recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Understand, folks. You know the saying that you can take a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink. Listen, you can shove the gospel down someone's throat as much as you like. They ain't going to believe it if they think. Because at the end of the day, they believe what they believe because they think they're right. Think about that for a moment. I mean, do you, do you let me ask you, okay, don't raise your hand. But do you think that you are right in believing the grace message? And do you think you're right in believing, uh, <coughs> pardon me, that Jesus Christ paid for your sin on the cross at Calvary? He died, he was buried, and he rose again. Are you absolutely certain about that? I hope your answer is yes. So you believe that, and you know that. Now you're going to get somebody who doesn't believe or believe something different. And we have to be careful that at this period of time, it is one of those times that we, I find many Christians let, 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 let the whole festivity suck them in into, into something, that we actually just get into things that, are, that we shouldn't be. And we need to be mindful of it. You know what the wonderful thing is? The book of Romans tells, tells us that nothing we face in this life can separate us from God's love. So don't go out and be worried about it. But recognize and understand and know what you believe. 
Now, the nation of Israel, if we read the book of Deuteronomy, they did not hold on to this. They did not heed this. And that is why the Lord Jesus Christ found the nation of Israel in apostasy when he came 2,000 years ago. And guess what, folks? We have Christian circles, Christianity, that is in absolute and utter chaos. That's the reality. I mean, you, you can attend 20 different churches and get 20 different messages. You know why? Because people have gone after church tradition, church teaching, following a man, following a woman, instead of following scripture. I have no problem with a person disagreeing with me if they are using scripture to make the argument. Because if we are all genuinely, truly seeking together, the Apostle Paul says we reason together. And sometimes we need to be mindful of that. When the Apostle Paul says, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. You know, and then I see the arguments and, and, and then one of the popular ones is going around saying, we don't understand why you, wh what Christmas is all about. Don't you know that Jesus wasn't born on the 25th of December? Yes, I do. The truth is he was born round about last week of September, first week October, somewhere around there. We know and we understand that. However, if that is when he was born, and the normal period that a woman would carry a child is, ladies, nine months. Feels like 10 years, but nine months. Right? When was he conceived? The 25th of November. There. So think about this. If you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ's birth, when his mother gave birth to him, it was in all aspects normal. She went through labor pains. She, they didn't have a place. I mean, he was born in a, a stable. We understand that. So it was certainly not, you know, oh, let's just phone up the latest hospital, go there and, you know, give you an epidural and no problem and you're not going to feel the pain and all that. It was hectic. Thankful I'm a man. It was hectic. But it was normal. You follow what I'm saying? What was miraculous was his conception. Because he did not have an earthly father. Now, just bear with me here. Think through me on this. So if, if we are talking in the spiritual realm, a miraculous event that takes place, where God the Holy Spirit causes Mary to be pregnant in a miraculous way. There's some other notions and things, you know, it was miraculous. No human intervention. She was a virgin. Let's just put it to you that way. Until the birth of her firstborn, the Lord Jesus Christ. She did not stay virgin because she had other children, by the way. So the notion that some religious circles say that she remained a virgin, not scripture. Not just another way of Satan messing with the thinking of mankind. But think about this. If you, in the spiritual realm, the whole angelic realm would have been witness to what event, folks? The conception in the spiritual realm. So if you want to mask and hide that, what would you cause? A massive period of time of rejoicing and festivity and bells and all sorts of other stuff. You follow that? Through the noise, see the miracle. Now, do we go and stand outside and stand with placards and like stop? No, what's the point? We, through wisdom, use this opportunity to bring the pure message. We separate ourselves as much as possible from all the noise and the hype. You know, 
when you when you go to the shops and you have all the noise and the, the music playing and, and all that stuff and you get into that euphoric position and, and they tell you it's a special but it's actually not, it's double the price but it just because they say it's a special, you think it's a special. You've not had that before, folks. You go to the shops and say special and then I look and then look at the other brand and I'm like calculating, I'm like, well, that's still cheaper than that. How does that work? Do you understand that? Do yourself a favor. Go and buy Here's a simple example. Dishwashing machine tablets. You know those little tablets? You don't use them. Right. And you go. The accountant in me whips out the cell phone with a calculator. Okay, how much is a wash going to cost me now? That's the price. How many in there? Divided by, whew, that's five rand a wash. Here's, a, here's one, no special, two day 98 a wash. Which one do I take? The one that's his special. No, which one do you take? If you really want to be, the cheaper one. As long as it's going to work. But what I'm trying to say, the enemy is making a lot of noise. He wants you to not be focused on that. Why? Take away the focus on the true miracle. So what I'm challenging us all is over this period of time. Focus on the miracle, folks. Understand the miracle. Understand the power of God working, coming into humanity. And yes, just the season of rejoicing. And of knowing that there is a God who loves you beyond measure. Who looked into the future and knew and understood you would be born and you would need a savior. And was willing to die on the cross. To sweat drops of blood. For you and for me. But let's rather just make it about all of the hype. You know why? Because when it's over, we can all go back to our own lives, depressive lives again. That's what the enemy wants. Folks, do you know that in America, some America is one of those countries you have, you know, you have 51 states, you have you have you have so much diversity. So when you do a, a sort of a study, you, you get a cross section of various cultures and so forth and so forth. Do you know and understand that this current generation is three times more depressed than the previous generation? But the previous generation didn't have all the cell phones. If you wanted to hook up, you had to meet on the street corner. You had to go with your bicycle or walk or whatever the case may be. Three times. But they got all the stuff. Why? Because that's the enemy's plan. Get you to rely on the physicality. And when you rely on it, it takes the real rejoicing away. And Paul says to them that are without the law, being not without the law of God. You see that? He says to them, and so he went to the Gentiles who didn't have the law because they were not part of the nation of Israel. But he says, I became like them without the law, but not without the law of God. In other words, the guy did not go out now and say, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to join this gang here now so that I can minister to them. But he understood and he knew that they were not, they did not have the law of God, but he kept, he kept himself under the law of Christ. He stayed within what God had Required. To the weak I became as weak. When you see a brother or a sister in Christ battling and grappling along, you know what our fleshly reaction normally is? Did you see? And that's what the enemy wants. So what do we do? I'm always mindful when I see someone stumble and fall. I'm like, that could be me. You know, I could say, oh, well, I don't have an issue with this or that or the next thing. 
but you know and understand that I could have an issue with something else that you don't grapple with. And we need to be mindful of that. So over this period of time, I implore you to, to, to be mindful of that, to focus on the miracle. Because when we focused on that, our mindset will be, what are we really truly remembering? What are we knowing and understanding? Then it does not become about a religious day. It becomes about our faith in Christ. And we use the opportunity of bringing folks and allowing the message to be given of God's love, his grace, his mercy. And that's how we use that period of time. Notice verse 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake. You see that? Not for him getting more popularity or being celebrated, but for the gospel's sake. Let me leave you with two verses, which are not in your notes, and then we'll pick up on this next week. John chapter 14, go with me there. As I was studying through this and reading through this again in preparation, I, I, I wanted to add these verses um, just to bring something here. John chapter 14, verse 27. The Lord Jesus Christ talking and he says, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know what I think when I read that verse? The Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And him in his humanity, sweating drops of blood. Because of the anxiety that he faced in his humanity. Knowing what, the pain, the anguish and the suffering he was going to go through. And yet, he was able to say, yet not my will, but thy will. How? It's that. It's his peace. It's the peace that he could have, which Jesus says, you can have. You follow that? That same peace that Christ could have in that moment of absolute despair and desperation, you and I can have when we trust in what Christ has done for us. John 16, verse 33, last verse. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now you can say to him, yes, but hang on. We don't always have things going wrong in the world. But folks, without Christ, even when things are going right, they're going wrong. <laughs> because people may have all of the things in this world. But if they have not the peace of Christ, if they do not have the Holy Spirit living within them because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we actually have nothing. We actually have absolutely nothing. The richest person in this world only has that temporarily. And let me tell you, even the rich have issues. <laughs> it has been said, a man with six children is more content than a man with six million rand in the bank. The reason is the man with six children doesn't want any more. <laughs> Whether you have six million, sixty million, what is the heart of man? We want more. So, folks, I don't know your exact circumstances and situations for you online listening to this after event. I don't know what you're facing. Maybe there's going to be a wonderful period of time that you're going to have family come down, that you're going to be with family and friends. Maybe, maybe things are really just going great. Praise the Lord for that. But maybe you're going through a bit of a challenge at the moment. I look across you folk and you online. I know these folks sitting here right now that um, you've lost a loved one. You've got loved ones who are not well. So what do we do? Sit down in a heap and give up? Or remember the miracle and the free gift that we have of salvation 
And let's make the most of this time. Family, friends are precious. They are here but for a moment. Let's use this opportunity now through this period of time to bring them to that understanding of God's love, his grace, his mercy. Amen. We'll pick up on this next week and, and, and I'll share a little bit more with you as we go through. Father God, we give you thanks. We give you praise for the goodness of your grace, of your mercy. We thank you that we could gather today to read and believe and trust your word. My prayer would be, Lord, that as we do so, that you will work effectually within us through the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that we will treasure family and friends, that we will know and understand the true miracle that the enemy would want us to not focus on. Help us through this period of joy and this, as many would want this, this season to be jolly, but help us to bring the truth in a loving, kind, caring way, being all things to all people, that we may win them for the gospel's sake. Thank you that we have the gift of eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ living within us. And Lord, as we go through this period of time, help us to be mindful of those around us and to reach out and to show the love, the kindness, the care, the compassion that you would want us to have and show as your word works in and through us. We give you thanks. We give you praise. By Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.